all right you don't have to turn there unless you want to but uh, I closed the last session by reading Leviticus uh, 19 verses 9 and 10 which I will I'll read again if you're there uh, feel free to read as I read you can probably read better than I can verse 9 of Leviticus 19 now when you reap the harvest of your land you shall not reap to the very corners of your field nor shall you gather the gleanings of your harvest nor shall you glean your vineyard nor shall you gather fallen fruit of your vineyard you shall leave them for the needy and for the stranger I am the Lord your God so the instruction was to not uh, once reap the stuff uh, don't reap all the way to the corners and the stuff that's fallen leave for the poor and that is charity and there's nothing wrong with that there's nothing wrong with government programs that have to do with charity that is meeting the needs of the poor not redistribution and uh, that's where Ruth met Boaz she was uh, gleaning in the field and so there's nothing wrong with charity in fact the Bible the Bible commands it personally and and for a nation by implication every every nation should uh, have some kind of safety net for the poor but not to equalize everyone's uh, amount of property or money and government has no business taking away property transferring property uh, it's you know it, it, you've been around a while it's just gotten uh, tremendously horrible in this nation and throughout the world and uh, a rejection of divine design showed up many years ago in in socialism where the means of production is owned by the government and Marxism uh, which is actually a, a theory uh, that is applied in communism and socialism is just a step along the way and the final stage of the society that Marx imagined uh, has it's a system of distributed equity it is uh, it's not the divine design at all and now we have not only talk about a universal basic income but it's creeping in uh, in many places like San Francisco and uh, there's a guy named Rutger Breckman uh, who wrote in the World Economic Forum May 29th 2018 and I'm just giving this definition of uh, universal basic income from him because he's a he's a proponent of it he's not an enemy of it so in all fairness I'll give the definition from him unconditional cash transfer that is enough to cover your basic needs it is guaranteed to everyone whether young or old rich or poor overworked or out of work and of course the damage from COVID-19 is being used by the World Economic Forum and other organizations as a, a uh, to put people in in panic and to uh, to get to just move in on a universal basic income and it, this is just one more means of controlling us and you'll be hearing 
a lot in the future if we're still here, which I uh, I hope we are snatched away very soon by the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I hope it happens before I get back to South Dakota. Um, and that's only two days. Away. Well, it's we're going to take a few days to get there. But uh, in any case, you'll be hearing about uh, ESG investing, environmental, social, and corporate governance. And it's this is just one more control. I've, I've just been reading about it recently, but it's one more control by those who think they are smarter than everybody else and know what's better for everybody else. Just another thing for control freaks, control freaks, another method by which control freaks can make everything how they think it should be. And Robert Armstrong, who is a financial advisor, uh, wrote for Financial Times about uh, this kind of investing, uh, that of course it is the goal of the ESG movement to push investors away from wicked portfolios, making their prices cheap, and setting them up to outperform virtuous portfolios over time. The win-win pitch, he wrote, is a fallacy. And that's what it is. It's, uh, it's just more pressure applied through power lust, power lust to leverage collective investors in this case, to put pressure on them uh, and they pressure investors to invest in enterprises that the appliers of the pressure think are moral. And of course, what would that be? Oh, what they think about climate change, what they think about political correctness, uh, making sure everyone feels belonged. It's all warm and fuzzy. It's all about feelings, and they would deny uh, our right to say anything about it, while I would never deny their right to say what they want to say. Uh, do they have their right to have their say about what corporations should do? They have a right to say it. I would not deny them of, of their right to say it. Just like the, the LGBT Etc. cetera, et cetera, et cetera how, however long it is right now. And then they have the plus sign afterwards because that leaves it open to add more letters. And I don't deny them the right. I don't try and shut them down from saying what they have to say, even though it, it, it is a blatant slap in the face to the design of our creator in Romans chapter one. But let them say it. Let them be responsible for what they say. I bear responsibility for everything I say, uh, every bit of it. But uh, thank God investors are still free to invest in what they want to invest in and make their choices in investments. And that is until uh, stakeholder capitalism comes along, which is a... a I won't get into depth about it, but it goes along the lines of, of, the, of what the things I've mentioned mean to investors. This is where corporations are accountable, not to the shareholders of the corporation, but they are accountable to the suppliers, to their suppliers, uh, to their community, uh, to the, uh, ultimately to society and uh, to their employees. And uh, again, all about feelings, all about political correctness. Uh, it, it's, if you want to read a great article about it, use your search engine to just go to different articles. Go to articles that support it and read them. But don't, you know, you'll come across an article likely 
you could use some of these as key words, but what is stakeholder capitalism and why is it dangerous? And uh, the site is Main Street Crypto. And it's a great article. One of the illustrations that uh, I kind of like to make it simple is this. When you go into a restaurant and you order a sandwich and the sandwich gets in front of you, do you owe the restaurant owner a bite of your sandwich? Do you owe the, the cashier a bite of your sandwich? Do you owe the cook? who put together your sandwich, a bite of your sandwich? Do you owe the waiter who brought you your sandwich? Do you owe that person a bite? How about the guy sitting next to you that has to has to watch you eat your sandwich and, and smell it? Do you owe him a bite of it? So that's a, a pretty good explanation, I think, uh, keeping it really simple, but all these things that are pressuring people right now are going to result. The goal is that they will result in uh, people not having private property. And it's absolutely anti-biblical anti right down the line. And I know that, that I'm preaching to the choir right now. And... Uh, I'll tell you what, these, we need these things drilled into our brains because of the deception that is ongoing. Every one of us. As I restudy these things, I find more and more places in the Bible that just consider it a given that we have a right to private property and that includes it's not specified in the bible but uh, that certainly includes uh, privacy to our own personal information now if you want to know where some of this is coming from turn with me to john chapter 12. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. We'll take it from verse 1. Jesus, therefore, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has, had raised from the dead. So they made him a supper there, and Martha was serving. But Lazarus was one of those reclining at the table with him. Mary then took a pound of very costly perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, who was intending to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold? for 300 denarii and given to poor people. And now John notes this in verse 6. Now he said this, that is, Judas said this, not because he was concerned about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he had the money box, he used to pilfer what was put into it. Therefore, verse 7, Jesus said, let her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you, verse 8, for you always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. 
But it says a number of things. One of the things that it says that is that uh, thieves often appeal to being compassionate. And that happens in government. Those who want to control you and want to distribute your property as they see fit are actually thieves, but they do it in the name of compassion, making sure there is equity, making sure there is social justice. And the perfume costing 300 denarii, that, that is very, very expensive. That one, one denarius was considered a good wage for a, a worker at that time. So that was quite a bit of, uh, of personal wealth. And Mary did this to uh, memorialize in advance the Lord's death. That is the significance of it. Of course, Judas didn't understand that. And the other disciples probably didn't understand it. But another thing that is brought out is the envy factor. Judas was envious of Christ, and he thought he had to step up and tell everybody how he thought it should be. Well, what right did he have to control someone else's money? In this case, someone who was uh, showing her, her love for the Lord. What business of it was his to suggest what Mary should do with her money? What business is it of the globalist to suggest what anybody does with their, with their money and their property? This goes far beyond politics. This is an attack, just as the LGBT da 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 plus movement is an attack on the design of our creator. Matthew chapter 20. And don't be familiar with this. Don't say uh, Griffith teaches this every five years or so. Well, uh, let's take another look at it. One of the places that expresses the divine viewpoint of businesses are various parables that were given by the Lord Jesus Christ during his earthly ministry. And we'll get into some more of these, but this is one of them. Parables in the Bible are brief narratives which illustrate spiritual lessons. The spiritual lessons are derived from principles uh, that go on in the natural realm. And this, uh, the use of the things that go on in uh, the earthly realm are used to portray spiritual truths and the fact that they are used gives the hearer a frame of reference to be able to understand some of the spiritual truth. So in Matthew chapter 20, we'll take it from verse 1 where Jesus taught Verse 1, for the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. He's teaching his disciples. Verse 2, <clears throat> when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. So here's the picture. It was early, early in the morning. He agreed with the laborers that came to work for him for a denarius for the day, considered a good wage. And he sent them into the vineyard. So verse 3, 
and he went out about the third hour and saw others were standing idle in the marketplace and to those he said you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right i will give you and so they went now the first shift was we don't know how early it was but the, the third hour would be in our time nine o'clock nine o'clock in the morning and again a contract was made but the wage was not specified but the landowner told the laborers that he would uh, compensate them justly. They trusted in the integrity of the, the landowner. And so it went. Verse 5, again he went out uh, about the sixth and the ninth hour, and he did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around and said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said, you go into the vineyard too. So this was getting quite late. The sixth and the ninth hour are the noon and 3 p.m. shifts. The final shift was hired at uh, 5 p.m. Verse 8, when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the laborers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last group to the first. When those hired about the eleventh hour came, each one received a denarius. When those hired first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner, saying, The last men have worked only one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the scorching heat of the day but he said to one of them friend i am doing you no wrong did you not agree with me for a denarius take what is yours and go but i wish to give to this last man the same as to you is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? Verse 15 says a whole lot. He goes on to say, so the last shall be first and the first last. Verse 15 two very important subjects. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with what is my own? His property, his business. He put up the capital for it. He makes the decisions as to his property and his business. But he asks a question, the, the landowner and the parable of Jesus, or is your eye envious because I am generous? And envy, class envy, is what these systems of redistribution are about. That's the source they come from, envy. The, the strong desire to, uh, to acquire what others have. And the response of the, of the landowner owner seems rather unusual on the surface. Actually, not so much because their work, well, the, the, uh, the time for the gathering was short and their work became, the, the, the labor of the laborers became more valuable to the vineyard owner as the day progressed. The job had to be done, so he needed to hire more workers and more workers, and their labor was naturally more valuable to him toward the end of the day. But that doesn't even matter. He had the right to do what he wanted with his business, to run his own business as he wanted, uh, which business owners have the right to do according to the, the precepts of the Word of God, as long as they're not... 
deceiving people as, as long as they're not committing fraud or other forms of criminality. But uh, business owners own the business. They put up the capital. They often work hard labor uh, strenuously to be able to put up the capital to start a business. So they hold the right, according to the Bible, to run their business. And when uh, people accuse them of doing something wrong, when they express that right, that's often out of envy. And that's the way the world works. Now, the purpose of the parable is to convey principles regarding the spiritual life, and those principles are, are summed up in verse 16. So the last shall be first, and the first last. Some of the principles are that late comers uh, unto eternal salvation, they have the same privilege of grace as the early birds do, even right up to the point of, a, uh, of faith in Christ on the deathbed. That happened in my own family. And it, it's a glorious thing. When someone on their deathbed finally wakes up and believes on the Lord Jesus Christ and you know that they're saved. And you'll see him in heaven. Now, another thing that is taught is that one's position, one's status, or one's work in this life does not give a person an advantage in gaining eternal life or salvation. Another principle that comes up is that all spiritual rewards for believers in Christ, such as uh, stipulated in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 15, all spiritual rewards for believers are related to the sovereignty of God. And yes, they are received on the basis of fulfilling or rejecting the Christian way of life, but it's God's business who gets rewarded what? Another principle, work done in a a legal spirit, work performed in a legal spirit is repudiated by God. Or I should say legalistic spirit. Work performed in a legalistic spirit is repudiated by God. But the, the thing that is so often missed about this parable is that in order for the spiritual principles to be conveyed, the laws of the temporal world which illustrate the, per, the, uh, the spiritual principles, the natural principles have to be themselves valid working principles. Otherwise, it, this would make no sense to the disciples. And the Lord intended for his disciples to get understanding about these parables. He prayed in, in Matthew eleven twenty five, 25 with thanksgiving that the, the, the Father, the Lord of heaven on earth, had hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, that is the intellectual, the intellectual, intellectually arrogant, those who think they're smart, and that the Father had hidden these truths from them and given them to babes. I've, I've cited that the past couple sessions. That's a powerful prayer. But is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own? Matthew 20, verse 15a. And that indicates that capitalism private ownership of the means of production and operation for profit in a competitive market 
capitalism is is the biblical way to go and people need to get in there and do something else oh i gotta fix things somehow there are poor people over here they should be they should be rich people should have more compassion about it. And they want to get right in there and think what should be done with other people's money and force things so that it is done. And what you wind up with is tyranny. What you wind up with is a horrible economy. And that's, that's why people are are coming in, are flooding in, is because of, of economies that have been ruined because they've gone against biblical principles. And these things have... Communism, where has it ever... Has it worked in Cuba? Where has it ever worked? If you, if you can think of a place, please tell me. All right. We'll take time to uh, bring it up to the Apostle Paul, what he had to say. We'll close with this. Turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. And I'll read fast to make it out by closing time. Second Thessalonians 3, beginning at verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from every brother who leads an unruly life, and not according to the tradition which you have received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example, because we did not act in an undisciplined manner among you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you, not because we do not have the right to do this. In other words, they had a right to compensation for their ministry of the word, but their ministry of the word was young, and so were the believers in Thessalonica. They were, they were uh, spiritually young. Like we're talking about, you know, a, a month by the time First Thessalonians was written, and a little bit more later on, but maybe a month, six weeks, not very long. So they wanted to be an example. So nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to you, not because we do not have the right to this, but in order to offer ourselves as a model for you so that you would follow our example. For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. For we hear that some among you are leading an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. That's the first thing that usually happens when people stop working. They become busybodies. That wasn't a verse. That was me. Now back to verse 12. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to work in quiet fashion and eat their own bread. Now, Vladimir Lenin cited the precept of, of 2 Thessalonians 3.10 as, as a necessary principle of socialism before it got to communism. But uh, he wasn't really, uh, I don't really trust his application of the word of God. In Ephesians 4 verse 28, the apostle Paul wrote, let him who steals, steal no longer, but rather let him labor performing work, uh, or rather uh, performing with his own hands what is good, in order that he may have something to share with him who has need. 
that he may have something to share through his volition, not because it is taken away from him and given to some somebody that somebody imagines has need. In uh, 1 Timothy 5, 8, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And I'll take 30 more seconds. Uh, it's 4.30 right now. Just to say this, that work as specified by our creator and how it's supposed to operate under the S-U-N, you work to earn, that really sets up a stunning contrast with how things are in the spiritual realm where you receive by grace, not by working for it. Romans 4 or 5, to the one who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the godless. His faith is counted for righteousness. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, by grace you have been saved through faith. That is that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Uh, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. You see how it is? We work in under the curse, and it's difficult in the world under the S-U-N, but then we receive freely, in fact, we can't work for it, eternal life under the S-O-N. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the definition that you bring through your word. Thank you for what you reveal to us during these very perilous times. May we walk in them. May we express them to others uh, when and where we can. And we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right. I'll see you three Sundays from now.